All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, people still feeling feeling seem to be affirming. So, while waiting for them, I'm gonna tell a bit of a metaphor of what I'll be talking about. So, today I'll be talking about results-only web investments. And I did a, a rehearse this session with my brother, and he he was confused by a word I used called learning. And um, to explain it to him, I used uh, I used something I saw on TV recently. I watch a show called Extreme Engineering. You may be familiar with it. And in one episode, they explain how they built a train tunnel under the, the Swiss Alps. And the project is extremely like, budgeted and set in time and scope and so on. There are severe penalties for delays. And they, they halfway through, they realize that the next section of mountain is not solid rock. It's penetrated by water. So they need to replot the entire course. And that was something they couldn't know at the, at the outset of the project. And being able to work with that and work with the fact that you learn the terrain as you go is, is, an, is a good example of learning. And he thought it was such a good ex so metaphor that it, it made it all clear to him. So there you go. That's learning. All right. Um, looks like it's time to start. All right. Um, my name is uh, Jakob Persson. Uh, most of you may know me from Node 1. I was one of the founders in 2008. I left Node 1 last year. And right now, I'm working with Svet. It's a company I founded. Um, here are my contact details if you want to follow me on Twitter or something. Um, Svet is a company that works with the lean startup methods. Essentially, what we do is that if you have an idea, whether you are working for a big company or you're an entrepreneur, and you need someone to turn that idea into a product uh, to find out market fit or find out its viability uh, as a real product, uh, you can talk to us. And we're going to prototype it on Drupal, among other things. And after, you, after, after that period, you have a much better understanding if your product actually has a chance or actually is viable. But that's what we do. Uh, it's, so it's not a web agency, but it's still a lot of Drupal, which means I get to go to events like this, which I love. So, all right, let's get started. 16%. 16% of all web products are considered complete successes. I would like to add that only 16% are considered successes. Uh, so how much is 16%? Well, it would be like one out of six pairs in the world check, and we all know that check pair is awesome, right? If it's something we learned this week, it's that check pair is great. I mean, I don't know how many of you that joined us at the beer garden last night, but... Uh, and as for cars, like imagine five out of six cars crashed as a rule. I mean, who would buy a car? Or look at pets. I mean, five or six pets would be abandoned, you know? Sad puppy. Um, and I think the reason for this is very simple. It's a quote by Theodore Levitt, and he was a marketing professor at Harvard. It might still be, it might still be. But he used to say to students that nobody wants a fourth inch drill. What he wants is a fourth inch hole. Customers buy benefits. They buy, they, buy what, they buy the impact of what you do for them. Uh, but most of our projects, they, they look like this. The requirements sheet, and it controls everything. The order of checkboxes, the, where the buttons go, and everything. But the questions we need to ask is, does the requirements sheet say who the people we need to involve and engage are? No, it, it doesn't. Does it say what the buyer expects the return to be of the project? And does it say why the buyer is spending resources and money on this project in the first place? No. No, it doesn't. So, so I mean, the requirements sheet is, is more often than not is, is a shopping list. In the words of Gorka Azic, I will be quoting more of later. Uh, you may be familiar with some of his, some of his books. Um, this way of doing requirements is like this. You go to the hardware store and want to drill. And the salesperson, this is what he gives you. This is the rep talk Govs gives you, like, oh, you know, the motor, you know, and the battery and everything. You're like, you're like, does it make a hole? That's what you're interested in. Um, so how can we build something that brings value to our customers by only focusing on whether it fulfills the requirements to the letter? I don't think we can. So when you leave here, we'll be leaving here with a, with a way to shift the focus from how to fulfill requirements to the letter to a way to work with oriented towards results. And the result will be happier customers and happier teams. 
So we need to emphasize investment in results and, and not costs and requirements. So to illustrate, let's have a poll. I'm going, to make, I'm going to ask some questions now about your last project, and I want you to raise your hands if you agree with them, if they are true. So, all right. First question. Did everyone involved in your last project understand what the intended business results of the project were? Not many hands here, no. Oh, one, two. Okay. The world isn't totally dark. Okay. That's Matthias, but he knows <laughs> this stuff really well already. So, um, Was everyone, buyer and seller, able to communicate clearly and transparently about the risks and problems that occurred? No. Okay, Matthias again. I maybe I have to invite you up on stage here. <laughs> All right. Uh, did everyone feel that the project was something they could be proud of in terms of achievement, quality, and innovation? Okay, that's better. That's good. That's good. We're getting somewhere. Um, did everyone involved understand the definition of a successful project and how success was measured? All right. That might. But well, you work for ThoughtWorks, so like, you guys are ahead of the game anyway. Um, so, in the end, did the customer get what they needed to address an actual business problem or opportunity? Oh, a few has. Okay, that's a 16%. Good. Statistics are true, at least sometimes. So, one to me, zero to Mark Twain. Um, all right, so let me tell you a story. And this is probably a story you, you recognize and you're probably familiar with in, in more ways than one. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about Widget Co. And they need a website because they want to get into e-commerce. And they found out that many of the customers would prefer to buy online if they could. Uh, this is Susan. She's the marketing director. And um, um, she knows that, the, she knows that the, the goal is to, is she wants to fund investors to e-commerce. And she also wants to understand her customers better because she's been reading a lot about you know, social media and social networks and Facebook and and like not just one channel communication and everything like, like all the latest uh, buzz. Um, so what she does, she proposes this to, to the rest of the management team and um, they have their strap for money now. So she tried to keep the, you know, keep the budget low, you know, I mean, it, it is a cost. Like you don't wanna, like this is expensive, you know, and they don't really have to have it, but it's still, it's, 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 it's not something they, you know, really can afford right now. So let's, let's keep the cost low. Um, so she reaches, researches a lot of uh, competitor websites. And she also involves the IT guy, Mark. And he usually procures software and hardware for this company because he's used to reading requirements lists and, and producing requirements lists. So Mark looks at other companies for ideas and people in the company find out about this project and they send their own, their own suggestions. Everyone in the company basically emails Mark and Susan with their ideas of what should be there. And the result is a big pile of requirements. Um, Mark thinks they're on structure, but Susan says, no, they'll be fine. You know, the bidders here, they, they've seen this before. They can sort it out. Uh, and the design and function requirements are all mixed. And, but they feel like, okay, so we have the function perspective that Mark brought and the more design perspective or more the uh, maybe more emotional perspective that Susan brought. Okay, so let's, let's, let's involve a mock-up designer that just makes a mock-up in Photoshop. Um, so they do that too. And they send it out. And they get a lot of phone calls and emails because these requirements were far from clear. A lot of this was ambiguous, and it's really hard to compare the bids too, because market institutions, first of all, they're not formally trained in bids, and they're not formally trained in, they don't have any time allotted for this work. So in the end, they end up going with the cheapest bidder. Now the thing is, even this bid was a bit higher than they had set the budget to, so they make a deal. They say that you get to feature this project and with an exclusive interview, interview with our CEO uh, after the project is completed. In return, we get 10% discount. And it's a new agency and they need the publicity, you know, so they're like, they agree, they agree to it. So they agree to run the project with a 10% with a smaller budget than they actually had anticipated. Now, Widget Co., they want to make sure that stuff could live delivered online uh, on time, so they set up milestones. They tie the milestones to scope and they tie them to dates. The reason for this is because they need to involve people in the organization to fill in content. So they don't really care about what the, what the structure of the project is, they more care about how it ties into the organization <laughs> itself. Um, and these are fixed, and they also add a penalty clause to make really sure the, the bidder won't screw up this time. But things that seemed easy when they were planning seem, uh, turn out to be much harder. 
And the requirements, they're not complete, they're in conflict. And they need more information. The problem is that Susan and Mark are not the ones with information. The person who is, is not available at this time. Uh, so what happens? Well, working days turn into working nights. And um, the agency is pretty inflexible at this point. Because they have already, first of all, they give them a really low bid. And then they actually accepted a discount of 10%. So they're even less willing, because a change might mean that they're going to run even more in the red. They're all already running in the red, but they might even run, run even more in red. So they're really strict on following this, the waterfall approach they accepted. Um, and what happens? Well, the project gets finished and on time, uh, but the team is ex ex exhausted after having worked day and night, and their project manager from the agency decides to, you know, he goes on medical leave. This was just too much for him. Um, and the day comes, and it looks six months later, and the figures are not impressive. There is no hockey stick. Um, so, what went wrong? Well, let's look at the scoreboard here. On the plus side, the requirements were, filled to, were fulfilled to the letter, but the team worked like crazy, the seller made a loss, and the buyer didn't see the results they were hoping for. So, how do we end up here? Well, let's analyze this project and, and, and break it down into its constituent parts. <clears throat> so projects usually start with a, with a need phase. The customer identifies a need. And the first mistake they made here was that they did not communicate the, the business goals to the team. And, um, and tech experts, if they don't know the business goals, they cannot offer better solutions. The management team thought they needed a website, but it might have been something else. And if they had been more transparent about business goals, the agency may, might have been able to offer other solutions or, or suggest other solutions. And the team was not aware of the business goals. And that meant that they could not react to unforeseen problems in a way that furthered those business goals. And this is something that we've seen in many cases. And those of you that studied management a bit might know about something called commander's intent. And there are cases, for example, in Iraq, where they see the tank crews are much able to react to unforeseen consequences if they know the reasons for their commander's uh, orders or what they are set out to do. Um, and also, and finally, uh, the project was given a too small budget. And, but the, the reason for that is very simple. No one ever talked about the business return or the, or the, or the investment perspective. It was so seen as a cost. So the project become, becomes cost-driven. And that causes a lot of problems, as we shall as we'll see, see soon. All right. So once the need was done, they started to compile the requirements in order to get a, get, a, get, a, get a good agency to work for them. The requirements were a shopping list. They lacked focus and forethought. I mean, they focused on the exciting new stuff and on the stuff that was easy to define. Not the stuff that was hard to achieve or hard to, because you know, the stuff that is hard to define is usually stuff that, that, you know, that brings most value. Putting together this presentation uh, was a lot of putting a lot of thoughts together in a structured format so I could communicate my ideas to you. That was the hard part, making the presentation itself, the slides and everything, that's the easy part. Um, and the requirements, they were not related to the business goals. They were half-assed, you know, like just a collection of them. And they were also skewed towards what was easily defined for someone like Mark. Um, and the mock-up just shifted the focus to even more relevant aspects. So finally, well, the next step is finally. Um, Next step is bidding. So finding the right agency. Well, bidding works a bit like window shopping. You know, you just looked around. What could they offer? What was the price tag? And the low cold requirements made it very easy for the agencies to make good bids. And the discount even forced the winning bidder to be inflexible later on. In bidding, the buyer tends to focus on what's easy to compare, not what's relevant to compare. And bidding is about getting the, the lowest price. Uh, and bids are very dependent on software estimates. And all of you that have been to my you know, early estimate sessions know that estimation is hard, if, if not near impossible. And this entire situation leads to, to, to a sort of knife to throat mentality for the agency involved. Um, and that makes, it, that makes it hard for them to be flexible later on in the project. The next step is the execution of the project. And, um, here there was a very central theme of a need for control from the, from the buyer. Um, 
uh, control the undermined trust learning and, and be able to react to the unseen, unforeseen. The scope-based milestones, they didn't help the business goals being achieved, and the scope-based milestones are the result of desire to control. And the desire to control comes out of fear. So they come up with these format of milestones in order to create a sense of security. The problem is that control limits learning adaptability. And as we shall see, any project that is not entirely completely definable needs to be, needs to be adaptable. Um, and all, this, uh, all of this together create a very bad relationship between buyer and seller. And it's our relationship and undermine trust. And trust is a known factor for success in projects. Trust between executive sponsors, project manager, and team. All right, so what happened? What was the verdict then when they finally saw the results? Well, the project fulfilled the shopping list, but we didn't see the, the results we're hoping for. We didn't see the hockey stick. We didn't see the conversion rate they were hoping to see. And uh, the, the team was not aware of the business goals, like I said, and it was, built to, it was built to order, but they failed to materialize. And this is not a rare case. I mean, just looking at some basic statistics, companies that aren't among the top 25% technology users, in those three out of 10 projects fail on average. And what are the causes? Well, lack of user input and involvement. In our case, the collection of requirements wasn't structured, and there was no user research done early on. So they need, need even have an upfront understanding of who we're working on, and the upfront understanding was limited in scope and limited in relevance. So no way. Uh, incomplete requirements. Did widget code do systematic collection requirements? No, they didn't. Did they link the requirements to the goals? No, because the goals were not communicated. They were not even mentioned. There was someone who had a hope that this would lead to something, but it was never verbalized. And was the agency able to offer advice or recommendations or insight or use their collective wisdom to improve the requirements? No way. And the expectations were just through the roof. Uh, they were not communicated, and the budget was more focused on trying to keep the cost down rather than trying to, you know, achieve the expectations that we're hoping to see. So, and even when projects are successful, 70% of them are over budget over time or defective in function upon completion, which means they're going to have to need additional work just to function. So my question to you is, is this sustainable? for you, whether you're a buyer or seller, for your customers or for your business. I don't think it is. So I have, a, I have an idea for you here. What if we inverted the scoreboard? What if instead of the other way around, we just flip it? So the team worked in an effective pace. The seller makes, makes a profit. The buyer sees the result they're hoping for. And the requirements are not fulfilled to the letter. Think about that one. So we need to change how we view project. And I am proposing a, a fourfold change here. Um, and uh, the change consists of four things. It consists of uh, viewing the results, we view the, the project as intended to create results. And then when I say results, I mean, bis but I mean tangible business value being created. Uh, th there's agreement on what success is and how it's measured. The, view, the project is viewed as an investment, and that follows naturally. If you view the project as generating a gain, then you can actually value, then you can actually balance the investment in, in relation to that. And finally, the project is characterized by learning on, on all parties. We can't foresee the future, and we accept that. And this change has some really amazing consequences. First of all, it creates trust. The parties uh, expect each other to act and deliver to the best of ability. There's no mistrust between them. Um, there's no thinking. I remember I had, I was, back when I was a freelancer, talked to one customer, and he said, like, well, there's no point of me telling me you how much money I have, because you're just going to try and sort of get away with a few hours possible. I'm gonna, just going to try and get as much work of you out as possible. And this is the way people approach these projects. And this is, what, this is the fear-based approach to project management. Um, gain. The project is done on budget, and both parties gain. I mean, the, 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 the buyer gets value, and the seller actually makes a profit off it. There's respect. There's respect for mutual experience. There's respect for the subject area, the business area experience that the, that the buyer provides, 
and the expertise in the actual the application that the seller provides. But it's purpose. Everyone feels this project is worth doing. It's not a waste. It, it, it's, it's, there, there's some value just in doing this. And there's a sense of, of value and achievement, being proud of something. You made something that you can put on your resume later or put in your company you know, among your case files. So if the world was like that, like what would it be like? So let's head back to our analysis here and see. Well, started starting at need here, the business goals would be communicated from day one. Um, the project budget would be based on the expected return uh, with a potential risk of failure taking into account. So say we see a return of, uh, of, of X amount over three years, then maybe we're going to invest a third of X amount in the initial phase and see what the results are. Uh, and uh, there's a me there are measurable success criteria that everyone involved with are aware of and also have, I mean, they bought into them. They, they believe they're possible and they believe they are, they're a realistic challenge. The requirements are focused, sufficient high level, and relevant to the success criteria. Um, and the success of the project will be judged on the success criteria, not on something else. Uh, and there's understanding that the requirements are just an initial understanding. There's going to be learning going on. There's going to be, we're going to understand more as we go. And there is an effort to make user research and a strategic analysis. And the project is going to be driven by a strategic roadmap. And requirements are not used to control the project. Instead, it's replaced by co ongoing communication. So it's a whole different, the, the, the project is, is uh, characterized by a whole different kind of culture and feel. The bidding process works differently. Uh, focus on just getting the lowest price is focused by a wish to find the company with best ability to deliver this. And software estimates only serve as input for the first stage. And the agency is actively involved in what they can provide. And I can show you in a bit how, how that could actually happen, how you can create that kind of bidding process. Um, but maybe the, the, the the biggest difference might actually be in the execution phase. So it's, inter it's, it's understood there's going to be learning. Things might be more difficult to ease than we first thought. And uh, there's constant learning. And some requirements are built as prototypes and they're tested. We build a subset of something or a simpler version to see if, if it works. And that might produce the value we're hoping for. We might have to build this entire complete blog with all those bells and whistles and everything. Um, and uh, communication and trust are replacing the need to control. And a key word here is that, is that how do we establish trust in project? Well, that's by always showing results. And I'm not so saying that the results have to be exactly the requirements, but something that takes us close to the goal. The projects that have really low amounts of trust are the ones who have been going months and months, and you haven't seen anything tangible, and just a lot of talk. Um, and this kind of flexibility is going to create a high degree of uh, it's going to cry, create high morale and a creative atmosphere because people want to be autonomous and want to be trusted and want to be trusted to solve problems according to their mind. They don't want to be micromanaged. Um, finally, the evaluation is based on the business goals. The team understood why the website was being built and designed a certain way. And everyone involved know what the project's goals were. And Everyone is also eager to see those goals being materialized because everyone bought into those goals. They didn't just go, they built a website and, and just, you know, ran off, you know. They actually, they were part of the discussion that led there. So this, this might sound, you know, too good to be true to some of you, but you might ask, where did all these ideas come from? Like, did it just, did it just make them up? No, in fact, I didn't, you know. They're all out there. And this is, this, these are, this is just a combination of <coughs> Agile, which I assume many of you are working with, and uh, something called impact mapping and effect mapping. So let's go through those real briefly. Uh, the Agile methods are more like a family, and some of them are concerned projects, higher scope, and some are practices like extreme programming. And um, even though we can trace back the ideas in Agile back to lean or lean production in the 40s, the Toyota model and everything, uh, they really came into popularity you know, in the mid-90s. And the, and the recent result of of, of this way of working is, is, is the Lean Startup. 
which combines Scrum and Kanban and Lean methodology. Um, do they work? Well, an early study of, of Agile product management showed 10 to 20% improvements in revenues, quality and cycle time, and 54% reductions in costs. That means you get 20% you get more for half the price. It's pretty good, huh? And even if we, and, and going back to see how success is going, well, according to Standish Group, uh, according to a 2011 report, they are three times more successful Agile product. Well, you might say, well, Agile isn't, you know, Agile isn't right, you know, for everything and everyone. And yeah, I can, I can agree with that. And there's something called the, the Ralph Stasis complexity matrix. And, and this is a great way to map out projects and, and, and the way they line up here. So on the top right, we see the complex, the unknown territory, and on the bottom, we see the simple, uh, the simple section. Um, those of you that remember my talk on early estimates know that I talked about reducing features into something you've done before, or trying to map it onto something you've done before. That effort is completely about bringing something that's completely unknown to something that's unknown. You take it, bring it from the center of this graph to the bottom left. The advantage of that is that you can actually apply a more waterfall approach. Because you if, if you're forced to apply a waterfall, you're gonna try and make the best of the situation, and that is to try and more waterfall, waterfallify what you've done. And, um, oh. so just like this, we can see that, we can see that uh, there are cases where waterfall works, and it might be if you work with an existing software with a, with a basically limited number of use cases, and you've done the same thing a thousand times over, then waterfall might be a great idea. But, in the world of Drupal, my experience is that Agile is best because every project presents a new challenge and a new way to solve a problem. So what is impact mapping? Well, impact mapping is, is not that heard of, but I'm, I'm sure this is gonna be really popular really soon. Impact mapping brings usability and speed to proven co product and project management strategies, helping them fit better into modern software delivery constraints and at the same time applying some great ideas from other industries to software delivery. What does it mean? Well, it means that it facilitates strategic planning. You get a big picture view where you go from the, from the goals to the deals, to the details of the implementation. And it facilitates learning. The learning I talked about gets easier if you work this way. And it helps us maintain a roadmap over the course of the project. And it represents a delivery scope that makes sense to everyone. You can actually have the executive sponsor, you can even have the CEO of the company and the development team in the same room and they can look at the same thing and they understand it makes sense. Imagine that. Devs speaking to people in gray suits, come on. <laughs> All right, so how does it look? Well, the impact map is a visualization of scope and underlying assumptions. And it's created collaboratively, like I said, you know, with the guys in t-shirts and the guys in suits. Uh, and it goes from the business goals and how it, and into deliverables. And some of you might have been to a session I called delivering business, how to deliver business value. And this is something I've talked about earlier, versions of this. Goiko has put this into a consistent model. There's a, there's a book that you can download and, and read, and he has a, a, there's a workflow ready you could just apply. The, the ideas are, 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 are similar, though. And this is an extremely powerful way to make sense of a, of a strategically driven roadmap. Um, and what it does is that it looks at, looks at the business goals, then we look at the people that we need to involve in order to achieve those business goals, we look at what kind of impact they can make, and what we have to do for them to make that impact. The effect map is similar. The fact is that impact maps have taken a lot of influence from effect maps. Originally, Goiko called, them, called, called his maps effect maps, but then the creators of effect maps felt that, now, nah, but this is not really what we're doing, you know? Like, you're just confusing people. Uh, so, but I think you need both. And effect maps, they are based on user research. They help you, this, they help you design for the end users. And you get a different deliverables out of these. And the impact maps gives you the strategic high roadmap to may help you make a prioritization decisions over the course of the project. And like I said, I think it's good to learn about both. So if you look at the effect map, for example, we go from the business goal, turn into user group, group uh, user need, and a feature. And the stuff we get out of this are stuff like personas, uh, wireframes and prototypes, which allows us to do usability testing, even before we build stuff. Uh, the, the impact map 
helps us translate our goals into actors, impacts, and, and, and deliverables. And deliverables aren't just, just features on the, website, on, 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 on the software. They can be manual tasks, they can be, they can be marketing campaigns, they can, be a, they can be a series of different things. Uh, and the really interesting thing here is that you can see the words build, measure, learn. This is, the, this is the lean startup cycle. You build something, you measure what works, then you learn. And then you do a so-called pivot. This method is extremely powerful if, you're just, if, you're just, if you don't really have a good idea who your market is and you just want to validate your assumptions. And the assumptions are falling out of this module by themselves. And you can, in a structured way, validate your assumptions and how they help you achieve your goals. But you might not be convinced anyway, despite all this overwhelming evidence. And, and one kind of argument I heard is that but without price bidding, sellers have no incentive to be cost effective. Well, price must, of course, be a factor. I mean, it's a market economy and, and you know, supply and demand. But we have to see the price in relation to the impact it creates. And a low price always comes at a cost. So there's always a cost involved. Um, so just, just have a bit of more multidimensional view of what, what price means. And the buyer, but buyer needs a set of clear milestones, otherwise the project will fail. Well, I agree that we need to have clear milestones. But, but they, should be, they should be tied to the business goals, not to, not to a, a, a scope we defined months ago. Because it's not relevant anymore. And they're just going to be a paper product. They have no value. And there needs to be trust. And everyone needs to have buy-in to the business goals. You can't just have business goals that the team that don't believe in, don't believe in realistic, or understand the rationale of. And they need to allow learning to happen. You can't put, you can't put them in a way of working in an adaptive way. Um, another argument is customers don't always know what the business needs goals are, and that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, and that's why we need to help them do that. That's why the method I'm going to show next uh, is extremely good at helping them identify. And, and this is a, often like an eye-opener for many customers. And uh, if you can't apply the five, uh, apply the, can, if you can't find the business goals right away, you can apply the five whys. The five whys method, you might be familiar with that. You ask why. You give a reason, why, give a reason, and you keep asking until you get to the money. And uh, you need to find something that clearly shows how to save money, earn money, or protect money. So that's the usual way you have there. That's where, that's where the business is. That's where the money is. Um, and even when the customers don't have an existing problem, business opportunity, you can approach customers in a field, a, bit, a field of branch where you think that you know what kind of problems they have, and you can foresee them and help them solve problems. That, that's a sales method. So depending on where you are, you can actually do this, you can do this pitch differently, depending on what kind of situation you are selling. Things can be done very differently from how they're, they're often done these days. So let's imagine the world was different. Let's imagine there was a second universe called Universe 2, and there is Earth 2. It's a nice universe. And in the nice universe, there is a much nicer story taking place. There's a widget co in this universe too. I need a website, and they want to get into e-commerce. And they made the same realization that widget co in universe one have realized, you know, that the, that the, the customer would, would prefer to buy online. There's a Susan in this universe too, and she's in charge of the project. Uh, and she knows that there's a need here to drive traffic to the e-commerce section of the site. So she defines goals. Uh, and she projects earnings, and she sets a time span. We want to see these things materialize in six months. And this informs the budget. They say, OK, we have potential making this much money. OK, that tells us how much it's worth for us to risk trying to create that. That's, a, that's an informed risk. That's an informed risk taking. Um, and she gets buy-in from the management team. They like it. It's rational. They could, they could you know, in case it really failed, they could even justify it you know, to the shareholders and to the board in case it, you know, it's a really big project. And they set up measurable times, uh, goals type time frames. They set up SMART goals, um, if you're familiar with, the, with, with SMART goals. SMART goals are, if you can remember the acronym now. <laughs> I can't. OK. Uh, ramp fever. Uh, they're specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. Exactly. OK, those are the ones. Uh, how good are acronyms, you know, we can't remember what it stands for. Uh, and they want to achieve this in six months, so they're time-bound. And she involves uh, Mark, the, 
the IT guy. And they also bring in a consultant because they know that bidding and this is, is not their forte. So they decide to keep the requirements high level. I mean, the goals here are very high level, so they want the requirements to reflect that. Uh, and they interview their, they interview their, their users. They, they are aware of the limited knowledge. They, they have limited knowledge, so they try to learn as much as is relevant. Uh, and they make, also make, a, like I said, they make an impact map, the strategic roadmap involving all stakeholders. So they have the strategic roadmap ready. Uh, they also involve someone to draw wireframes, just to get an understanding of how things could hold together. And the wireframes are sufficient to detail so they can get a sense of what they're trying to do, but not so detailed that they are, they're completely locked in. So by now they feel they have a basic understanding. Uh, but they know they will have to learn a lot during the course of this project. Uh, and, but they're confident with this degree of upfront planning. Uh, so that what they do now is they create a presentation. The presentation shows the goals, the budget, the requirements, and what they have learned. They try to be as transparent as possible about what the company sees, the risks, the opportunities, and so on, and how much the company sees they could potentially make. Um, and <coughs> three agents respond. And the agents, they make pitches. They come and they talk about how they see and how they, how, how they see the vision and how, what their ideas are, how to, how to achieve these goals. And the social market get a lot of good ideas this way. They come to think of things they didn't even can, didn't think of in the first place. Uh, and they pick the, uh, the agency eventually, based on the track record and based on these interviews and these pitches. And the price in the case is just a factor of the many. They just, the price tag is important, but it's not the number one decider. Um, the team, the, the agency sees this project would suit an agile workflow really well. And the team, the team is, is cross-functional. It consists of developers, designers, and people with marketing skills. And they work closer together. The product owner and the team and, and Susan and Mark, they work closely together. Uh, and they can turn directly to the customer if there's something they need to answer, they have a question for. They have a question they need to answer for. Um, and the team takes big pride in shipping regularly, and that's something that Susan and Mark like, because that, that, that builds a sense of trust. Uh, so they start off with a kickoff, and Susan is very enthusiastic. Uh, they, I mean, they love what they do, uh, Susan and Mark. They believe in their jobs, and the team sees that, and they're like, wow. I mean, get to work with these people, like, wow. And they start to believe, they start to share the same visions as Susan and Mark have. And, uh, and the, foc the, the focus of this exercise is, is, on, is on defining roles, expectations, and accountability. So we're, we're not so much time bound down on the right requirements now, but we still need to see results, and people need to know what's expected of them. Uh, and the clear expectations is another thing that reinforces Susan and Mark's trust in, in the project. Um, and the initial work, it takes takes a lot of thinking and it results in, in, in several backlog items. Uh, and the team then advises them what's, what's, what's high risk and low risk and how much time it will take. Um, some things are left at the moment because they might be clearer and later, and we can learn more, and some things are just worked on right away. And that's the thing when you work agile that you understand that your horizon of knowledge moves all the time. In one project, we, we sat down and we, and this is my early days in doing Agile, so don't judge me now. <laughs> so we sat down and we estimated 250 backlog items in one room. And after that I realized, this is not Agile, we're doing waterfall by Agile. So like if you try to estimate your entire back backlog, epics, like the big use stories and all, forget it, you're not doing Agile. Um, the team have continuous meetings. Um, and they decide that some things are going to be time boxed and try to as a prototype so to figure out more. This is the hard to, to, hard to, hard, hard to, the hard to implement stuff. Uh, and the team thinks that they can build them in a much simpler way. And it turns out that it's true. But as it happens, they can't build everything that is in, in the backlog. And some requirements are wrong, but this time in this universe, the person who has the knowledge is there, is available. Uh, but they know enough to prioritize. So what Susan and Mark do is that they sit down and try to figure out which requirements contribute most to achieving the business goal, and those get implemented. And they don't get implemented exactly as they were initially thought, but they implement it in such a way that it generates a business goal. And Susan and Mark are fine with that, and so is the, 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 the management team of the company, because they're, they're in the loop. They know what the team is, is, is talking about, they know what, what's been going on, and they understand the rationale, and they know that this is the best best decision they can make. Um, 
So the entire backlog doesn't get delivered, but that's not a problem as long as you can see the results you're hoping for. Um, and everyone is excited to see the result. Uh, and they had a lot of fun, even though it's been a, it's, they've been had to work a bit hard, but they had a good they had a good time all together. And uh, it, they, they they launched the website, and suddenly it appears that there's a small bug that blocks user registration. The agency has had a good experience and isn't 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 um, is, is, is eager to, to maintain this good relationship, they, they jump in immediately and fix the bug. And the results are hoping for to see in six months, they materialize in only four months. Uh, and Widget Co. is super happy, and they're considering another project to expand on the existing website they just built. So in Universe 2, there's a stronger buyer-seller relationship, there's better use of money, there's higher success rate, and there's higher satisfaction for parties involved. So the question for me to you is, which universe do you want to live in? So, the steps we need to take. How do we make this happen? Well, first of all, I'm proposing a new dictionary. In the new dictionary, cost is replaced with the word investment. Requirements are replaced with results. The plan is replaced by learning, and control is replaced by trust. These constitute the fourfold, the fourfold change I introduced earlier. You see the project's intended results. There's agreement how to measure success. The project's considered an investment, and it will be a learning experience for all parties involved. But to do that, we need to start with goals, first of all, before we start thinking about how this website could potentially be built. All right, so the customer says, we need a better website. You ask, why? It's really hard to find out who we are and there's no way to post comments or feel involved. You ask, why? They say, a big share of our customers want to feel involved. You ask, why? We need to reach those customers in order to channel more sales to our site. That's a million dollar answer. <laughs> That's where the money is. Follow the trail to the money. All right, so we got a money answer. All right, this is something we can work with. All right, the next question is, how many users do you need? So what we do is that we define a, we define a, we define a goal. We design a, design a scale, a meter, a way to measure it, and we can look at the order list on the e-commerce site. We set a benchmark. What is it at now? What is the constraint? What is the lowest we can potentially accept, but, and what is our target? So we're seeing 3,000 users per month right now. We need at least 5,000 to break even, and we want to reach, reach 7,000. Oh, so five, I should say 7,000. Um, by when? Next question. In six months. Uh, and the customer says, we can tolerate higher costs, operations costs, for a while. Uh, so we had another milestone that involves that too. So we know that while we're reaching these goals, we can also accept higher operational costs for a while. but they also want to reduce them as soon as possible. So the next milestone will be about adding even more customers, but also reducing the operational costs. So now we have two milestones, like this. And then you ask the customer, what are these results worth to you? And the customer says, good question. This tells me how much I want to budget for this project. When the customer decided how much it's worth to them, you go on to draw the, the impact map. So in the center, we put the, the goal, 7,000 orders per month. You do this for, each of, the, for each, of the, each of the goals you have. Why are you doing this? Then you focus on the impact, the, 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 the actors. Who will help us? Then the impact, how will they help us? And what do we need to do for them to be able to do that? And you think again, who else could be, help us create this impact? Well, apart from customers, you could involve friends of customers or repeat customers. And they all need different deliverables. Customers need to be able to place orders and tell friends. And uh, in order to decide which ones you want to go for later, we can use like voting. So you can write all this on a whiteboard, and then people get some golden stars, and they can put the stars on the ones they believe to be most important or lowest hanging fruit and so on. And don't get stuck on thinking that these are software. Some of the things might be done manually. It could be like a one, two time thing. It could be sending out an email. So don't, this is not just about software. It involves everyone. It's not just something the developers do. Everyone in the meeting can contribute. 
So finally, we can see the, the concrete deliverables here. And uh, now we have something that looks like a backlog. We need to implement a form of product recommendations and a Facebook like share function. So these impact maps, they visualize deliverables and assumptions and link into business goals. And that helps you justify every feature and every deliverable you do in terms of the business effect. And uh, a simplified impact map could look like this. And the, the milestones are to the bottom left and the, and the, um, and the actual map to the top right. The impact map also allows continuous learning. So after about after six sprints, by the time you worked on, on, on milestone two, you expect to start to see the results of milestone one materializing. And, uh, and then you can look at this, this, the data you have and say, are we achieving our key targets? No, we're not. <coughs> what of our assumptions are wrong? And then you go back to your map and see what your assumptions are, and you validate those. So my recommendation to you is the next time you start a project, you should ask a few questions. You should ask, why do we want to, why, why, do, why do we or why do you want to invest in this project? And that will tell you the, the goals, the milestones, the investment and results. Who needs to act for the goals to be achieved? And that will tell you who the actors and the personas are. How would the actor, actors contribute, how would their actions contribute to the goal? That will tell you the impacts and the user's needs. And finally, what will the actors do to create impact? And then you get the deliverables, features, and the actual backlog. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there are two books I can highly recommend, both by Gorkacic, uh, Impact Mapping and Specification by Example. And links to the books and uh, more articles are available on my website on that URL. Thank you. All right, we got about um, 10, 15 minutes for questions. So there are microphones here if you wanna, if anyone has any questions. Hi. Um, yeah, I've been kind of coming to the same realization that you need to turn the way projects get started around from how much is this gonna cost to how much is this gonna generate. Um, and also the, the other thing that's kind of crystallizing for me, this DrupalCon, is that this works a lot better when the person you're talking to is not a project manager, but a product owner. Because a manager doesn't care how much it's gonna generate. They have a budget and they have a set of goals to achieve, you know, a set of boxes to tick. Whereas a product owner cares about the result rather than the boxes. Do you find that you've got the same thinking or am I talking well, rubbish? I, ideally, the product owner is, 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 um, is committed to the business goals. So you, have, you don't have that dichotomy there to deal with, ideally. Yeah, so how do, how do we stop the project managers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, by, you know, by, I, I would say by, by making them talk to, talk to the stakeholders, the people that are investing in the project, they're putting their money. Uh, All right, so then and, what and, and change the roles. Like, I hear people say this thing together, yeah, the, the project manager's role is stand, stand between uh, right. between the, the executive sponsors and the team, and no one should talk except through the, the, the project manager, and project manager will take the team from the executive sponsors and vice yeah. versa, and translate. Gatekeeper. That's bullshit. Yeah. That doesn't work. Okay, so that's what I was gonna say. How, how, what happens then is that the stakeholders or the, you know, the hippos start saying, oh, I haven't got time for this. I, I, think, the project I think drawing together. this kind of impact map together yeah. with the executive sponsors is a great way to get discussion going and make people understand each other and, and talk in a common language. Cool. I think it's a great way and involve everyone. Uh, and I'm not everyone, like, like you can't do it effectively with more than five, seven people, you know, but, yeah. but enough to, to establish that kind of trust. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Hey Mike. Yeah, and, and the point here is that if you, if you focus on trying out a, a few of these assumptions in the effect map in the form of a, 
what in lean startup called the minimum viable product is essentially a subset of features which is usable, but enough to make sure that your assumption about the market, about the end users is correct. You build, you're going to spend in more time than you have to to get it out there and see if you see the effect. And then you're really hard on yourself. You don't see the results you're hoping for, rethink. Uh, so I, th I, think, I, think you can, I think you can really easily fail fast working this way because you actually outline your assumptions so clearly. Uh -huh. I would talk about trying to create learning as soon as possible, trying to get knowledge as soon as possible. Because I mean, I mean, the word just like Mike said here, like the word, the word uh, failure is is stigmatized in a, in a lot of countries. So I would also avoid that. Depends on who you're talking to and what, 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 they, what, kind, of, what kind of meaning they put into the word. Uh, but try to talk about learning. Trying to do, uh, do as little as possible to figure out if you're on the right path or not. I was a little bit late coming in, so I hope you didn't already answer this question. But I wondered if you could talk about um, convincing internal business structures to use this type of methodology. And what would you say to Europe's fixed bid problem, um, because this is a big departure from that. It's it's the exact opposite of that. So, what's your one uh, sentence pitch to say this is better than that? I would use. I think. I think the the evidence, the statistics we have. I think it speaks for itself. It's just that people haven't connected the dots yet. They haven't seen the project successful are driven by business goals and not by fulfilling requirements. Uh, that's, what I that, that's what I would say, and I would also invite them to this kind of impact mapping exercise. It's okay. an eye-opener for a lot of people. We'll send them a link to your presentation. Right. Um, so the other follow-up question to that is then, if your you know, hierarchy is saying, well, we only do fixed bid because that's all the market will allow, is there a way to say you're wrong without being a jerk? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean... Being a jerk, I mean, stand up for what you believe in, you know? I'm not saying this is easy. I know a lot of us are in that kind of situation. And the problem is I talked to, I was talking to a company that operates in, in Romania, and they have a much lower labor cost than we have in, in West Europe. And if you're operating a local market, say you're operating in France, and you sell to French companies, you cannot, you cannot win a fixed price bid with these companies because companies would have the labor cost in, in, in India somewhere where, where it's much cheaper to live. They can essentially, they can do a fixed bid and then they can add like a 50, 60% like safety margin on top of that. So they can take a fixed bid with, with risking very little and they can still outbid you in terms of price. So we can't work this way. We can't compete if we, when, when companies start outsourcing and they start turning to, to companies that are based where living costs are cheaper. So we need to start to think value-based when we talk to our customer, value-based consulting. Because that, that puts all of us on an even, even playing field. Well, um, that's a very good. That's very good. You mentioned that. I didn't mention that. But split testing, A/B testing, you create two versions of the website, and you try them different different audiences, and then you see if see which one actually helps you get closer to your goal. That's a great way to determine if you're on the right path. And by doing a lot of building these prototypes fast, and 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 these two versions, you can actually get a, you can really get really far in a very short time. I would use that in combination with detailed statistics, like not just Google Analytics, but even have reporting inside the software itself, so you can much more easily follow what people are doing and try to understand the user's behavior. Uh, and like I said, you can ask people what you want. Like, like that's, you know, there's a book by, uh, by Alan Cooper called The Inmates Run the Asylum about the idea that you can ask the end users what they want. They want. You have to observe them and see what they do.
All right, we've got four more minutes. Hi. As an answer to the, or one answer for the fixed bid question that we have done in EXO is that uh, we split the requirements or the, 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 what we agree with the cost and backlog, the must have, should have, and nice have, and then we came that the, that with this amount of money we will guarantee that you will get the must haves all, yeah. and then the rest if it's possible. So in a sense we give them a discount and upper limit. And then later when they found out this works for the first project, they typically then don't, don't talk about the upper limit the next project. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's a great way. That's a great way to prioritize your, your features. And if you can even link that prioritization to how they contribute towards achieving the business goal that you set up, then it's even better. I'll just be the voice of contrariness again and follow up. I find Moscow completely unhelpful because everything ends up as must. You get 75% of the project as must. Yeah, I know. So I, know. So I actually just go, there's like now and no, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> There's two priorities. We do it now, <laughs> and then we'll look, we'll see. But that might that might be that, that might be one of the hardest problems. Like people, they have to have everything now, and they can't make any. But then they're thinking wrong, and th you have to educate them. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I mean, if we gotta prioritize, and I I'm a firm believer in doing something a, a little bit by doing it really great, and build on top of that instead of getting everything in place and instead ending up with a bunch of defects. Uh, and make them realize that you know that small victories are much better if you want to get forward fast. All right, a minute and a half. All right, you look like you're you're satisfied with all this information. All right, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>